Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Alan Kaplan, the CEO of UW Health. Welcome to our 2021 Wisconsin Medicine Livestream Series. We will be bringing you programs one every other Wednesday evening now through June. Tonight's program focuses on neurodegenerative diseases. This group of disor disorders includes a wide range of conditions that result from progressive damage to nervous system cells or to the connections between the cells that are essential for mobility, coordination, strength, sensation, and cognition. Whether caused by purely genetic mutations like Huntington's disease, or by the complex interplay of genes and environment like Parkinson's disease, they can progress quickly, stealing time with loved ones, independence, and quality of life. Because people are living longer, many of these diseases will dramatically increase in prevalence over our lifetimes. While current therapies may ease the burden of neurological symptoms, there are no cures. This evening, we have invited the clinicians and scientists who lead the search for new treatments and potential cures for neurodegenerative diseases. They will share new approaches to the biology of Parkinson's disease, how changes in brain function can be identified decades before diagnoses of Huntington's disease, and how exciting new therapies have the potential to replace dying brain cells and improve the lives of Parkinson's patients. First up, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Kathleen Shannon, Detling Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurology. Dr. Shannon will present how the search for novel mechanisms of disease may uncover biological processes that can be targeted in the search for a cure. Welcome, Dr. Shannon. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, and welcome everyone to this special program. I'm delighted to be able to present some information about neurodegeneration and Parkinson's disease, the search for targets. Next slide, please. Neurodegeneration just means uh, that it's a disease that's caused by brain cell death. And there are many neurodegenerative diseases. Some of them are listed on this slide. They include Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, and Huntington's disease. And as Dr. Kaplan mentioned, Huntington's disease is a purely hereditary or genetic disease. For these other degenerative diseases, there are some very rare genetic forms, but for the most part, it's a combination of the genes you're born with and the environmental exposures you encounter as you age. Next slide, please. So one of the things that, that links all of the neurodegenerative disorders together is that they're stories of proteins. So on the bottom here is Huntington's disease, which you'll hear about in the next talk. Uh, and what you can see on this slide is that each disease is associated with some abnormalities in specific proteins. In the case of Huntington's disease, it's a protein called Huntington. And in the case of Parkinson's disease, which is my topic, it's a protein called alpha-synuclein. What happens over time and with exposure to, to uh, environmental toxins and to age itself, uh, there's a tendency for proteins to become misfolded. Nerve cells are very sophisticated and they have to have the exact right amount of every protein at every moment to function properly. And over time, there's a tendency for these proteins to become misfolded and to clump up in the brain cells. I'll show you a picture of this later. And this starts a process that we call misfolded protein stress that interferes with the brain cell function and causes them to die. Brain cells don't replace themselves. So over time, each brain cell lost accumulates a burden of uh, disease disability. Uh, we have, for many of the conditions, we have treatments that will affect the symptoms, help the symptoms of the cell death, but really the holy grail of research is finding ways to protect brain cells, what we call neuroprotection. Next slide. So we're gonna focus on Parkinson's disease and the history tells us a lot about Parkinson's. So Parkinson's disease was first discovered in 1817 and by uh, James Parkinson who described a tremor, some rigidity, some slowness and problems with walking and balance. We still use those exact same symptoms to make a diagnosis. Next please. It was in 1912 that it was discovered um, that there was an abnormality that was visible to the naked eye in the brains of people with Parkinson's, specifically in this area uh, in the top panel here that's called the substantia nigra. It's called that because it's dark. And it was noticed that people who had Parkinson's disease had lost the brain cells in that area so that the dark area was no longer dark, it was pale. And under the microscope, you can see that pale purple blob surrounded by a halo. 
and that doesn't belong there. That's a protein, and it was described in 1912. Next, please. It took until 1960 to figure out how that protein caused the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And it was discovered that people with Parkinson's have low amounts of the chemical dopamine, which is a, a chemical messenger between cells. And it took another seven years before the discovery was made. And this is one of the miracles of modern neurology that you could give patients a compound, very simple one called levodopa. Their brains would turn it into dopamine and it would improve the symptoms. And next please. And finally, it took until 1997 to discover the name of that protein, the alpha-synuclein that was described in the brain cells in 1912. Next, please. So one of the interesting questions is when the neurodegeneration begins. So we think there's a genetic component and that's illustrated by the little DNA molecule next to the young boy here on the left side of the screen. And then you see a series of pictures as this boy aged and he eventually became Pope John Paul II. And the reason I show this slide is because Pope John Paul developed Parkinson's disease during his tenure as the Pope and the whole world watched him get sicker and sicker over time. Uh, he did this with grace uh, and, um, and a good spirit. Uh, and what we notice over this time is that both the aging process and environmental exposures contribute to the progression of this from a young healthy person to a person with a neurodegenerative disease. Next, please. So one of the questions is what are the factors that cause this degeneration to begin? And my particular interest is in whether inflammation that comes from the intestines is a pathway to degeneration in Parkinson's disease. And there's many reasons to think this. The first one is that we know that the environment contributes to Parkinson's disease and the intestinal tissues are the largest surface area for toxins to enter the body. If you stretch out the intestines, it's about the size of a tennis court. So this is a very rich surface. The other thing to know about the intestines there is there are many, many nerve cells there and they're connected to the nerve cells in the brain just below the area that's affected by Parkinson's disease. And we also know that they are the source of inflammation that can travel throughout the bloodstream even and attack the brain. So next please. So we had some research questions based on what we know about the important functions of the gut and how they might be affected in Parkinson's disease. So the first question is, is the gut leaky in Parkinson's disease? So in other words, does the Parkinson's disease gut allow environmental toxins to get into the system. We were particularly interested in research question two, which is, is there exposure to something called lipopolysaccharide or LPS? This is a bacterial toxin, which if purified and injected into animals causes them to have Parkinson's disease. So it's a very interesting toxin. And we know the only source of that toxin in the environment is through the gut. The next question was, does this toxin cause inflammation, the toxin and the leakiness? And then the last question is, are the gut bacteria abnormal in Parkinson's disease? And if you read a lot of uh, science in the papers, you see that, that bacteria in the intestines are a very hot topic for research. Next, please. So I'm not gonna show you a bunch of graphs and uh, cartoons or pictures. I'm just gonna tell you what the summary uh, and the summary of our research is that yes, the gut is leaky in Parkinson's disease. And yes, there is exposure to the bacterial toxin lipopolysaccharide that we can demonstrate in people with very early Parkinson's disease. So what we found was that people with Parkinson's disease absorb twice as much of a certain sugar as people without. That means the gut is leaky and it lets that sugar in when it should keep that sugar out. The second thing was we can detect evidence that people who have that leak uh, the leak of bacterial toxins actually enters into the bloodstream, and we can do that by measuring the response to toxins in the bloodstream. Uh, we looked at pieces of intestinal tissue that were collected in a modified kind of colonoscopy and found that, yes, the intestines are in inflamed in Parkinson's disease that we believe is from the damage from the leak and the toxins. And then finally, that people with Parkinson's disease do have different bacteria than people without, and those bacteria are of the harmful kind. We have a balance in our intestines of healthy bacteria and unhealthy bacteria. And people with Parkinson's have much more unhealthy bacteria in their intestines. Next, please. So in order to test whether this is really important, sometimes we have to go back to a mouse model. So this is a very clever experiment that we did in conjunction with a scientist at Caltech. So in this first panel, we see a mouse that has been genetically engineered to have a gene that increases Parkinson's disease in mice. Uh, it causes them to make more of this abnormal protein. And the first panel are, are germ-free mice. So these are mice that are raised without any bacteria at all. And those mice that have the gene do have Parkinson-like behavior. They're slow and they're stiff. And you can see that abnormal protein accumulating in their brain cells. 
If you then take a mouse that has normal bacteria and also carries that Parkinson's gene, both the behavior and the amount of protein are quite dramatically increased, which means that the bacteria interact with that gene in a way that produces a much more severe Parkinson's-like behavior and that protein in the intestines and in the brain. And then finally, if you take that germ-free mouse and you put bacteria that we have collected from our Parkinson's disease patients, and I told you that there's more harmful bacteria in those, in that, uh, those collections, you see an even more dramatically increased uh, behavior of Parkinsonism in those mice and also that Parkinson's disease protein. So what this shows us is that yes, intestinal inflammation can drive a degenerative process in the brain in mice that are genetically determined to have some evidence of Parkinson's disease behavior. Next, please. So what is the role of the gut in Parkinson's disease? We know that the leaky gut exposes the body to toxin. We know that the toxin causes inflammation in the body. In mouse models, abnormal bacteria worsen the Parkinson's disease those mice get. And we believe that this may lead to new discoveries uh, to intervene in diet or in medications which can change this inflammation and exposure and thus slow disease progression. Next, please. Which brings me back to this cartoon, uh, this slide picture of Dr. of uh, sorry, Pope uh, John Paul II's uh, life with Parkinson's disease, and raises the question: How early would we have to start a treatment to make a difference in this progression from a normal, healthy young boy to an elderly person with Parkinson's disease? Uh, and the next talk really is going to help us to answer that question. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone. We're having a little bit of a technical difficulty, so you're getting to see behind the scenes and how the magic works. Dr. Kaplan, I believe you're muted. Um, can okay. we hear you now? So uh, thanks, Dr. Shannon. I didn't see that one coming. I would never have made a connection between our intestines and Parkinson's disease. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jane Paulson, professor of neurology. Uh, Dr. Paulson will discuss how more than a decade of human studies will soon allow us to test remarkable new experimental therapies in Huntington's disease. These treatments are slowing down the progression of disease in people who carry the causative genetic mutation. Welcome, Dr. Paulson. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan, and thank you for the uh, ability to the time to talk about Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is an inherited neurodegenerative disease. And what that means is every person that has Huntington's disease, their children have a 50% chance. Uh, I think I'm on a different slide. Yeah, next slide, please. Oh. Huh. Uh, this is a different version. I'm just going to go right with it. So Huntington's disease is, uh, that's it. Huntington's disease is a uh, inherited disease. So every person who has Huntington's, their children each have a 50% probability that they will inherit that gene from their parent. You get one from your mom, one from your dad, and you might get the HD one. So it is a disease that we know in advance what genes they are living at with risk for disease. It's an interesting disease because it actually, though a rare disease, uh, is similar to really common disorders that you are familiar with. It has a movement disorder similar to that seen in Parkinson's disease, although the movement itself is very different. It has a cognitive or a thinking disorder similar to that we experience in Alzheimer's disease where our thinking processes are impaired. And it also has a psychiatric or behavioral uh, um, change in processing that occurs. That's more similar to like schizophrenia or depression. So this triad of symptoms is what people experience when they have Huntington's disease. Next slide, please. Let's go back up to the previous slide. I think that we skipped, there we go. Uh, given the remarkable advances 
that have occurred over the past decade, uh, both for the human brain, but also for the human genome, it is coming to the point where these genetic diseases, some of them, we may be able to intervene in using gene therapy. And Huntington's disease is one of those brain diseases where we are now able to go in and change the message that the DNA is giving the body and the brain. And given this therapy, we it may make it able to prevent the disease from occurring or slow the progression of the disease and help people better plan for their future. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Thank you. There are challenges to neuroscience. Uh, the brain is a complex organ and there are many challenges to tackle to allow healthcare professionals to provide better care for persons with brain disease. One challenge is just to translate the rich science that is emanating from our basic sciences. Basic scientists use cell models, fruit flies, zebrafish, mice, as Dr. Shannon talked about, and rat models, and even larger animals such as uh, pigs and sheep to study human diseases. Another challenge is that there are rising costs of bringing new treatments and scientific advancements to the clinic, to the bedside, and to the daily lives of real people. So in addition to translating our findings from our animal and cell models into the daily lives of real people, we now also have a large price tag. It's been estimated that to bring one new treatment to the market can cost between $985 million and $2.6 billion. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Great. I've learned that for this type of research that's gonna bring new treatments to the community and make a difference for persons suffering with neurodegenerative disease, we really need a can-do attitude. And that works best when tackling the big challenges that we have in healthcare, with particularly in neurodegenerative disease. I've also found that here at Wisconsin, people are willing to work hard and get dirty to learn as much as we can about the families suffering from disease and to advance our knowledge base for these diseases. What's required is what's been now called a team science. Teams require everyone to work together, to share ideas, to advance knowledge. And these diseases are now causing us to create new teams. These new teams have to include the families, the patients, the doctors, the scientists, and everyone else that can help us advance knowledge to provide care for these patients. Next slide, please. When embarking upon the goal of trying to better understand very early changes in disease, I asked families and patients and friends, who will volunteer to work with us to prevent Huntington's disease? And I was simply surprised at the overwhelming response from our families. These are families that are living with a gene with a known certain risk of a future neurodegenerative disease, but they were willing to come out while they were still healthy and volunteer to have brain scans and lumbar punctures and blood drawn and to take new measures so we could figure out how to identify disease before it happens. Next slide, please. Here are two figures showing how new treatments for diseases are tested. On the far left, we see that when a person becomes compromised with disease, we show decreases in inability. Uh, for example, in, in Parkinson's disease, you may have increased tremor, slowed walking. In, in Huntington's disease, you will manifest movement disorders, thinking disorders, and emotional or mood disorders. The question is, how can we determine how to move the window back so we can prevent disease? Often we wait for limitations in our daily lives before requesting help from our doctor. And that's what the figure on the left shows, that we see these declines and then it, we wait until we get to a certain level 
when then we can be trying new clinical trials or experimental therapeutics. And then we can see the red line is someone who did not get the experimental therapeutic. The blue line shows the progression of disease. Now move to the figure on the right. Our goal in our lab is to move this back so that we can try to intervene at a time when people can still raise their kids and enjoy their jobs and their vacations and really maximize their functioning and their quality of life. So the figure on the right shows us if we could move up and begin to intervene before the disease starts, it would be a method of preventing disease or slowing it or stalling it. Next slide, please. The, it was a big question to say, well, how can we measure disease before it happens? We usually wait till the tremor occurs or till the memory loss is evident to treat someone for neurodegenerative diseases. So we asked the families, the Huntington's disease people themselves, what do you think we should measure to identify it earlier? We want better measures, more sensitive measures. And they stepped up and they gave us the answer to this first big question. They came up with many ideas that I've depicted on this slide. They said, oh, check smell, check eye tracking movements, check very sensitive measures of coordination, speed, and gait. Um, we also drew blood and we collected cerebral spinal fluid and we got brain images and we measured everything on computers so that we weren't measuring in terms of seconds, but in terms of milliseconds to see if we can detect the earliest signs of disease. Next slide, please. This study occurred worldwide. We uh, had to conduct it at 33 sites around the world because many people thought people that don't have a disease won't volunteer for research. There's no motivation to do so. And this study showed that people are willing to volunteer for research even before they become sick. In this study, we recruited nearly 1,500 individuals who are willing to go through many, many uh, experimental measures and paradigms to help us determine what is the best way to detect disease before it starts. Next slide, please. One of the findings or one of the outcomes rather from this large research project is that it really forced other studies to come together and say, let's share our data. Let's move our knowledge of Huntington's disease faster. And so this bar graph shows you many studies that have all donated their data to put the data together so we can learn more about disease faster rather than relying on one site. And team science is becoming a very powerful method for us to learn about neurodegenerative diseases. In this bar graph, the red bars is the data that we contributed from the PREDICT HD study. Another outcome from that study is we did indeed find many, next slide please, sorry. We did indeed find many predictors of Huntington's disease in the future and we found many different measures of those that we looked at in the blood, in the spinal fluid, in the brain measures, but also in the measures that the families had given us and that we uh, quantified in our research design. We were able to see by taking these more sensitive measures when a person was close to their onset of the diagnosis of disease or when they were really still far away. This can help us decide when should we go in to prevent a disease before we have a loss in functioning. Next slide, please. Another benefit of this research that we hadn't planned on was simply the feedback and the joy that everyone had in working together in partnership. Our volunteers, who we knew we were asking a lot from, were thrilled to be in partnership with the scientists and the doctors and the other uh, experts to really make a difference in what we know about Huntington's disease and really try to understand better. Next slide, please. Today, there are over 30 new companies looking at new treatments for Huntington's disease. There are 11 treatments that are in gene therapies and two of the four of these are already completed and have promising results. So the we need to continue this research 
to better just next slide, please, to better now define what are the best measures so we can help people make that decision. When should I go for these new gene therapy treatments? If they do indeed show to be beneficial that they can slow, delay or stall the disease, uh, we wanted to give it, empower families and patients to make that decision at the best time. So join our team. We're now called Prevent HD. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paulson. That was extremely interesting. It wasn't just the science, but the aspect of the social, communal, uh, uh, emotional part of the research. Uh, our final researcher this evening is Dr. Marina Emborg, Professor of Medical Physics, the Center for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine, and the Wisconsin National Primate Research Center. Dr. Paulson will discuss thrilling new results of basic science research into the stem cell treatments of Parkinson's disease. Welcome, Dr. Emberg. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Uh, Kaplan. You just heard about the great research that Dr. Shannon and Paulson is doing. My lab is focused on understanding neurodegeneration and finding solutions. For investigators like Dr. Shannon and, and Paulson, they are looking for solutions for their patients. So to do that, next slide, we developed and used models. We use all kinds of different models. You heard some from Dr. Paul, she mentioned, uh, Dr. Paulson mentioned some of them. Let me tell you the ones that we are using. For example, we use gels that can be um, use like brain surrogates when we are testing new new methods for injecting things into the brain. We use mathematical models to predict outcomes. We use cell cultures to assess gene modification, like the things that Paulson uh, was showing to you. And we also use monkeys and rodents to test the safety and efficacy of gene or cell therapies. And the model that we use depends on the scientific question that we are asking. And you have heard a number of scientific questions today. I want to tell you the one that we have been wondering for a while. Please, next slide. How can we replace neurons loss to disease? This is something that we have been thinking for over 10 years with Dr. Sushan Shannon and I. And um, we have some, some good news that I want to share with you. I think we found a solution. Please, next. Personalized therapy for Parkinson's disease. Let me tell you how the research process um, goes. What we, what we do is, my lab first takes a small skin biopsy from a monkey and we give it to Dr. Shang's lab. He makes the fibroblasts from those skin cells, uh, he multiplies them and then put them in a cocktail of reagents and he transforms those cells into cells that are um, a blank slate, induced pluripotent stem cells. And then he put those induced pluripotent stem cells that can become any cell of the, of the body into another series of cocktails of reagents until he can make the differentiate these cells into what is missing, what is lost in Parkinson's disease, midbrain, dopamine producing neurons. And he gives it back to me. So in our surgical suites, we transplant back those cells into uh, the same monkey that gave the fibroblasts. Next slide, please. Our goal is to develop these beautiful neurons that can integrate in the brain, extend their axons, but they do not uh, trigger an immune reaction in the, in the, in the body. Um, so they have a chance to grow. And the, the good thing is if you are their own cells, your body recognizes these cells as its own. Next, please. As important as the cells that, um, that we are going to inject are the methods used to place them in the brain because you need to put the cells in the right place and in the right amount. To do that, we use real-time intraoperative MRI guidance, meaning that we inject the cells directly into an MRI. 
what you are seeing here in these images are um, brain uh, uh, pictures, basically, with a, taken from with an MRI when, while we were doing surgery. And those black blobs that has a red cross in the middle is where the cells were inoculated. For this study that I'm so excited about to, to tell you about is we compare the effects of the cells that were created from another monkey and then placed in one monkey. The, so those are the allogenic cells and cells that were differentiated into dopaminergics and placed in the same subject. Those are the autologous cells. Thank you. Uh, next, please. So we did the surgeries and uh, we followed the animals for a period of time and we did different uh, outcome measure, we obtained different outcome measures. And one was for PET imaging, positron emission tomography. What you are seeing here are positron emission tomography images in eight monkeys. The red brain areas, the red that you are seeing there as the brain areas that corresponds to, to regions of the brain with high dopamine activity. The reason that you see the red in only one half of the brain is because we make the animals Parkinsonian with a toxin called MPTP that is known to cause Parkinsonism in humans too. So those animals lost the dopaminergic neurons that Dr. Shannon was talking to you before. So this is the way that the brains looked before we gave a graft. Uh, click, uh, next, please. The animals that receive the um, allografts didn't have much change after the, the transplants. But something different happened with the autologous cells. Next, please. The grafted cells recover the dopamine activity where it was lost. That's marked with a little uh, white arrow. Next, please. What was most interesting is what we found after we look into the brains of the animals. We euthanized the animals after two years because we needed to make sure that this, the grafts were safe and that we could explain uh, the results that we were finding. What we found was that the neurons in the autologous graphs integrated and extended their neurons, their axons into the brain parenchyma. If you see the top uh, of the two top images, you have, you can see how the allogenic graph seems to be smaller and this, the neurons seem to have walled themselves off the rest of the brain while the autologous graphs, the neurons in the autologous graph, extended their axons and integrated into the brain. That's, just, that's better shown in the two images that you see in the bottom of the screen that has the allogenic and then the autologous. You see how many fibers were generated and they were extending from the core of the graph towards the rest of the brain. Next, please. What, what, when we got all the data together, we we assess if there were relationships between the amount of clinical recovery of the animals, because we did a lot of behavioral tests, and the amount of dopamine activity that we were seeing in the PET imaging, and also that if there was a relationship with the number of dopaminergic neurons that we found that we counted in the brain with that were uh, placed there with the grafts. And what we found that was a relationship between these different measures. The Parkinsonian, the improvement of the Parkinsonian signs match the higher peak signal or the higher dopamine activity and the greater number of grafted cells. Next, please. Based on those results, we realized that we could predict how many cells are needed to improve Parkinsonian motor symptoms in humans. This was ultimately what we needed, what we wanted. We wanted to be able to inform the field about how many cells you really need to change the Parkinsonian syndrome. So if you look at a monkey brain compared to a monkey human, obviously the human brain is bigger. The, if we think about the specific area of the brain that where we're placing the cells is the putamen. Next, please. And if you think, of, if, we, if we measure the putamen in a rhesus monkey and a human, we know that the human putamen is approximately four times bigger than the monkey. So what we realize based on our 
calculations about how much improvement related to the number of cells that we had obtained, we realized that if we had, we wanted a 50% improvement in the humans, matching the 50% improvement in the rhesus. What we were going to need was uh, go from the 70,000 cells that we found in the rhesus to approximately 300,000 cells. Next slide. Something with, with that we did not predict was the positive effects of the grafts in depressive behaviors. We know that uh, Parkinsonian patients, although it's typically defined as a motor uh, problem, patients have motor problems, they also have depressive behaviors and that affect their daily life. So uh, now we are, we are working hard to try to understand how could it happen that this positive result happened to occur because we didn't expect it. It was not supposed to be. And so next. But well, that is how we start our next scientific, our next scientific quest. Next, on Wisconsin. And to finish, last slide, please. I want to tell you this amazing work was possible because of my ama amazing group of collaborators here at UW-Madison and also the greatest students that are, are part of all these studies that uh, are committed to find solutions for Parkinson's disease even in the middle of a pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamburg. And it's a powerful reminder of the intersect between uh, basic uh, scientific research and clinical research and how the two are so interrelated and can't live apart. Uh, we have received a number of insightful questions during tonight's presentation, and I'd like to pose them to our panelists. Our first question uh, this morning, or this evening, I should say, is for Dr. Shannon. So Dr. Shannon, we've had lots of questions from our audiences about your information on gut and inflammation. Is this a recent breakthrough? Will there be standard testing anytime in the near future? That's a great question. Uh, we started this work a, a while back. We were the, really the first people to do any of this work and it's kind of exploded into a very large field of scientific investigation. We have some ideas already about uh, things. So. One of the things that's come to light recently is that there's a relationship between certain gut inflammatory diseases, like what's called inflammatory bowel disease, like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, and then later getting Parkinson's disease. And that people who've been treated with certain anti-inflammatories uh, for their inflammatory bowel disease don't get Parkinson's. So it's possible that a medication similar to the one that that has pre prevented Parkinson's and some of these people with inflammatory bowel disease could be uh, modified in a way and used to treat Parkinson's. So I would say that this is an extremely active research topic by many labs across the world. We do know that things like um, uh, an, a Mediterranean diet reduces inflammation in, in the gut and possibly in the brain and exercise is helpful. And we already are counseling our patients to follow a Mediterranean diet and to exercise because those things have powerful effects on inflammation. Um, but I think there's, uh, there are many possibilities for this to turn into effective therapies. One of the issues is going to be, how do you introduce the therapy earlier? How do we identify people in the way that Dr. Paulson has identified when Huntington's patients, the early changes, how do we pick people out who have very, very early Parkinson's that's not diagnosable yet? And there are a few clues to that. So there are certain sleep disorders like acting out your dreams at night, the presence of constipation, loss of sense of smell. These are all things that might allow us to put together the profile of the person who's destined to get Parkinson's and start these anti-inflammatory interventions earlier. There are also people, we're not doing this here at UW, but there are also people studying whether, whether transplants of, by, of bacteria from uh, one donor into the intestines of the P Parkinson's patient will uh, influence um, the progression of the disease. Uh, so there, there are many things that are kind of on the launching pad that can be studied in patients. We're really excited about it. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dr. Paulson. How do researchers identify patients for prevent, preventive uh, methods without a genetic identifier for disease? 
Well, that is uh, the challenge that all the neurodegenerative diseases have had for many years. And so whether or not there's a gene, we still are always looking for the earliest signs of, of the disease. And in Alzheimer's disease, I can use it as, a, as an example, we've tried to create more sensitive tests and there is a uh, what we consider a precursor to Alzheimer's disease that we call mild cognitive impairment. And if people start to show that they have just this mild cognitive impairment, those are the people that we really want to start to follow to see if we can come up with better predictors of which ones of those will progress to Alzheimer's disease. So we can also think of prevention treatments for this type of neurodegenerative disease. But it, it, it really takes all types of study. We have to study the common disorders and we have to study these very rare genetic diseases. And then the combination of putting the two together is how we can advance our knowledge base and create new treatments. Great, thank you so much. And uh, this question is for Dr. Amborg. Uh, how is creating or replacing neurons different than other types of tissue replacement? That's a great question. It's a very complex answer because you have to think how the brain works. Brain is, is a, com a lot of neural networks that are all working together. These neurons are using different chemicals to pass the messages and the brain has such an important responsibility to keep us moving and thinking and, and creating and stuff. And so to introduce neurons in the brain, you need to prepare cells that, first of all, you cannot put neurons that are fully grown, mature, because the axons are gonna be uh, broken, like broken arms. So you need to have baby neurons that are already committed to a certain fate in this case, for example, midbrain dopaminergic neurons. So you need to figure out what is the right time to inject the cells. That, that way the cells can get into the brain and grow into their mature and repair the neural network. So that is a very different than, for example, if you are pre trying to, let's say in diabetes, trying to uh, put cells that could pump insulin compared to the brain, it's not just a, neural, a, a neurotransmitter that you're trying to replace. Great, thank you so much. And Dr. Shannon, before the closing question, would you be willing to answer this question? Where does funding come from to support this kind of scientific research? That's a fantastic question. My The research that we did with the intestinal changes in early Parkinson's disease was funded by donors, actually, um, by families who were interested in this question, people who had Parkinson's disease uh, relatives that they wanted to honor with a donation, and also the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which likes to provide funding for um, very early science. Uh, sometimes the, the more traditional funders like the National Institutes of Health, our government sponsored research funding organization wants things to be farther along the path. And so getting these very early, very interesting studies started often uh, means that we have to rely on funding from foundations and from, uh, from donors. I would like to add something else. Uh, I, I, I agree with you, uh, uh, Kathleen. For example, the methods that we developed for real-time intraoperative MRI for cell delivery, they were uh, with the support of UW 2020 from Madison. And that right. helps so there are develop. internal internal competitive grant systems here at UW. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, here's the closing question uh, for all of you. And uh, in any order you all wish to take it, uh, it is clear that you bring passion uh, to the table and we could all feel it as you describe your work and, and the things that you do. And of course, the things you do are extremely exciting. But the audience wants to know what makes you excited about your work? What drives you day to day? What, what drives your passion? So can I start? Okay. So I am a clinical neurologist. I take care of patients in the clinic. Uh, 
most days. Um, I've uh, shepherded families with Huntington's disease through several generations now of Huntington's disease and diagnosed many, many patients with Parkinson's and helped to manage them. And what, what makes me excited, much of what I do is in clinical trials, so new interventions. So taking that, for example, that induced pluripotent stem cell work, moving it into the clinic. How do we design the studies? How do we do the studies? How do we prove that things work? So for me, it's both taking care of patients every day, seeing how devoted they are to finding better treatments and cures and how passionate they are about the research. Uh, and, and then being able to one day, you know, bring something to the clinic that makes a real difference. There's nothing more motivating than that. You go next, Jane. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to say, yes, I agree with everything that Dr. Shannon said, because that is exactly what happens. The PREDICT study was initiated because I am a neuropsychologist. So people come to a psychologist when they don't yet have perhaps the movement disorder or a diagnosable disease. And it became very frustrating that people had all these more subtle symptoms and signs and yet there was no way to help them because they did not have a diagnosis yet. And that happens a lot in all fields of medicine where we have this pre or early signs and symptoms of something that's, that is, is we're not feeling good, but we don't know what it is yet. And so I'm really motivated to work with the families and listen to them and acknowledge what do they see is changing and how can we help them all the way through the life course of a, of a disease. Before they um, become impaired, how can they maximize their quality of life? life? And then the second piece uh, I wanna answer is this uh, experience we just had by working together with colleagues that are doing such exciting work in Parkinson's disease and in animal models, as well as the neurologist who's taking care of all the patients that I see, really brings home the excitement and the, the value of team science and working together and sharing our ideas. I always feel I'm a better scientist when I'm working with others working with families, working with patients, and working with great colleagues. So that's very stimulating. I think it makes me a better me to work with others. Oh, me, to me, what makes me excited is, is the opportunity, the opportunity to think about impossible things that need a solution and, come them, and make them possible and bring them to people, investigators like Shannon and Paulson. And the other part that is, incredibly exciting for me is to bring forward with with us all this new generation of students that are so committed to make a difference and that's that that makes me want to go to work every day this has just been a great session what a great group of enthusiastic amazing people scientists doing great work uh, for a greater purpose. I wanna thank you for joining us this evening and for your great questions. I hope you enjoyed tonight's program and that you'll continue to tune in for our next Wisconsin Medicine program on Wednesday, April 7th, focused on asthma. You can sign up to receive reminder emails and watch past sessions at wiscmedicine.org. Thank you for your interest and on Wisconsin. <laughs>